Hello everyone. Thank you for the very kind introduction to talk about one of my favorite topics, uh, which is deep generative model in general and generative adversarial networks in particular. Um, so this is the second time I will be talking about uh, generative adversarial networks, GANs as I call it, or often people call it GAN. Um, so I have talked about GANs uh, in Lyon uh, back in 2019. That was the first time I came to Lyon uh, and it was a beautiful, beautiful city. I'm sure it still is. Um, and I really enjoyed the time I had uh, with the presenters. I, I made uh, uh, like I, I I met a lot of my colleagues from the Mikai Society there here, um, and then I also really enjoyed the hospitality so much. So uh, uh, it's a bit pity that we can't do uh, such a thing again this year because of the pandemic. But at least we are gonna be talking about uh, staffs virtually, and I can still uh, interact with all the students out there uh, during the live session. So that would be really wonderful. So um, I will be talking about uh, GANs. And if you can see here, GAN has the generative part, the adversarial part. Now network is by now, everyone knows it's about deep neural networks, okay? But to understand the first two words, which is the generative and the adversarial, let's take the first one first. Um, so which is generative? Um, to introduce the generative, I will use contrast. So in the sense that I will first try to explain which is what is discriminative learning, which is something that most of you are very familiar with. And then I will talk about the generative modeling. So uh, the typical scenario of discriminative modeling is to find the decision boundary. So imagine you have the reds and you have the greens and what you are really caring about is the decision boundary here that separates the red from the green. That's the simplest of the discriminative scenarios. Now, when you are really talking about the generative modeling, the idea here is to really emulate the data generation process. Um, now, really, one way of thinking about it, it could be that if it's visual domain, we are interested in emulating uh, the image, generat image generating process, and we are interested in really generating realistic looking images. Um, the idea really is that by generating realistic looking images, uh, we might go one step closer uh, to the actual uh, understanding of the image generation process. Um, a gross approximation could be uh, if your deep neural network predicts classification um, in, in medical image context, that could be uh, diseased versus healthy, pneumonia versus no pneumonia, or something uh, in that line. Um, then you can think of it as most likely a discriminative model. Whereas if the network is predicting pretty pictures, um, like here, for example, then you can guess that much more likely, it is much more likely that it will be a generative model. Now, uh, I must say again, uh, I must emphasize this, that this is a gross approximation, what I said right now. Um, but gross approximations are there for a reason. They let you really make the bigger blocks of class classes. And beyond that, of course, you can just use your intellect to figure things out. Um, so now the question really is, why do we care about generative adversarial networks? So let's start uh, uh, for GANs with the amazing results that it can produce. Um, and this is really something which is uh, uh, 
very interesting for Gans because uh, before that uh, generated generating image of this quality was almost unheard of. So I will start with the first example where you can see what we are trying to do is super resolution. And if you are using standard bicubic method to super resolve an image which has a lot of uh, um, high, uh, like lots of texture and high frequency components and details, you see it's rather smoothed out. Um, the super resolution with ResNet is certainly better, but it's still missing details, for example, on the head gear versus when you are looking at the super resolution guns. Uh, these are pretty early work. So things has moved on to much bigger and better things. But just to give you the fact that if you look here, it's uh, much more details are preserved here. Another example is basically translation, image to image translation. So you see here images may be taken with your smartphone and you are trying to see or you are trying to think how uh, one of the painters, be it Monet, Van Gogh or Cezanne would draw such a picture. Um, you have to remember like remind yourself the fact that uh, uh, you won't find uh, Monet to draw you a picture like a painting exactly based on whatever smartphone photograph you are you have taken you have a finite set of Monet uh, uh, um, paintings out there in the world and you really have to learn the style the artistic style of Monet to really accomplish this uh, task and what you are doing you are putting it through a dumb neural network and it's doing it so that's kind of astonishing um the last thing I typically ask uh, if I am doing uh, this lecture in the class that which one of these faces are real and which one of these faces are fake. Um, so I guess most of you uh, can imagine the answer is that all of these are fake faces. These are fake faces of people who don't exist. But if you see the hyperrealism, the, 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 the amount of details that is there, it's no way to say that like you, you can't simply have any like way to really claim that these are not uh, real people. So guns can produce result of spectacular proportions. Um, but this is about medical imaging, right? So one question you can ask is what's there for me in such a thing? So I will start with two uh, published research on guns for medical imaging. Uh, so one of the first one I will talk about is in this left one where uh, uh, my colleague Yelmar, uh, he proposed this idea that uh, you can generate um, fake city, pseudo city, we often call it, from MR images. Now, you might be uh, asking what is the motivation of such a thing. Uh, uh, so the motivation really is that uh, when you uh, do radiotherapy planning for tumor ablation or uh, uh, tumor resection, for example, you plan all those in, in the CT images. But the CT put uh, the patient into a lot of radiation. Um, on the other hand, MR, uh, does not have like does not uh, 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 put the patient into so much harmful radiation. So if you can really, but the problem of MR is of course it's not really as, as standardized as uh, CT, so you can't really plan uh, a therapy uh, based on MR. But you can then if you can do MR to pseudo CT, and from there you can do the therapy planning, the 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 radiation planning. Then you can say MR only radiation planning is possible that significantly reduces the exposure to 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 bad ex uh, radiation for the patient. Another example here is uh, anomaly detection, where uh, uh, this one's. Uh, 
now quite old back in 2017 both of these came out in 2017 very early works of uh, generative adversarial networks in medical imaging and this one in particular showed how you can train a generative neural network on healthy images and it can detect um, diseased images and exactly can focus on the diseased regions all without ever really supervised like any without any supervised training on the diseased images so that's quite cool if you can do such things um so yeah to answer the uh, question of what's in it for you the first thing is that it's becoming more and more common that uh, generative adversarial networks can be helpful in generating proxy for uh, training data. Uh, this is really important because uh, of the costly annotation, imbalance issues, uh, we can use uh, generative new new adversarial networks. Um, the second problem uh, that we typically face is similarity metric. So whenever you go into the problems of comparing two images, um, we have to use some form of similarity to compare two images. Um, now, uh, this is especially too, true in case of registration literature where you really have to, uh, for registering the two images, you have to calculate the similarity uh, for each of these transformations. And whatever hand uh, crafted uh, feature or metric that you use for uh, uh, similarity, that's never good enough. There is always something missing. Uh, this discriminator of the generative neural network can provide uh, a way, or generative adversarial network can provide a way of actually solving this problem and finally domain shift is a big big problem where adversarial uh, training strategy of the uh, generative adversarial network can be quite handy uh, in solving the problems so considering i have successfully captured your attention by now um, let's see what i am gonna be talking about today um, so I'm quite inspired by Mary Kondo, who is the tidying up guru. And I basically tried uh, to design this talk as a pedagogical dissemination of guns uh, to be applied in medical imaging. Um, so I'm trying to really tidying up guns in a way so that it's palatable. Uh, nowhere I'm claiming to be exhaustive. Rather, I am going to provide intuitions of how this might be a useful technology for your research. Um, after listening to this talk, if your creativity starts flowing uh, towards new possibilities, I would consider that as my success. I will also talk about uh, uh, some um, venues where you can publish those uh, creative uh, uh, results. Um, but all in good times. So the way I have divided uh, this talk is again based on uh, Mary Kondo's way. So the first part of it, which is always the most difficult one, is your closet where you just dump your um, clothes. So we, in our case, the closet is the theory and the key guns and how these are derived. Then we will go move to your kitchen, which is basically the medical applications. And we will talk a bit about the adversarial learning and we'll show basically that uh, uh, the like how to tidy up your kitchen, which is really something that brings food to your plate. And finally, we'll talk about more of the emotional stuffs, the, the, the limitations of guns, and then uh, uh, what are the problems that is still there? What are the new theories coming into to sort some of those problems? Very uh, uh, tiny bit here and there. Right. So let's start at the theory now. Okay. And that's a massive pile of things that I'm putting out there. Um so that's a problem, uh, but what really Mary Kondo suggested, and I'm going to be doing it, is basically the first step of this method is to take out your clothes from your closet and pile those up. And then we are really uh, um, sort what is necessary and what is not. 
So I will first pile things up of how uh, we really ended up into this uh, particular idea of generative adversarial learning. So the idea is to sample a seed from a simple distribution. Uh, you can think of it as a multivariate Gaussian and then learn to transform the seed, this noise vector, uh, through a function uh, g to an image. So this image is uh, g of z and this function can be anything but because we are in the era of neural networks so we are talking about this function as a uh, universal function approximator like a deep neural network. Okay. Um, so this entire setup is then uh, an unsupervised setup where uh, you are really uh, having images maybe but no annotations is really required. Um, the thing though is to really learn something uh, for this black box generator G, um, we have to have something which uh, is uh, a critique function. So it's called perplexity. Uh, perplexity is the probability distribution function for the generated distribution. So uh, the idea here is given any image, uh, output an estimate of the probability that this model is uh, outputting that particular image. This means we need really a separate algorithm that critiques uh, the black box generator G uh, by calculating the perplexity. Now it's it's a very difficult task and we need another entire day to talk about uh, the, the entire literature around perplexity. What GAN does is it, it, it actually uses a three-step or three key ideas together uh, to actually sidestep perplexity and still solve the problem on unsupervised learning. So these three steps are following. So you first sidestep perplexity with deep neural nets and then you bring the gradient feedback from the discriminator and then you actually uh, create a game of many moves that you play until you reach to an equilibrium. Too many things. So let's do one thing at a time. So the first step, which is really uh, sidestepping perplexity with a uh, deep neural network. So what we are really interested in here, uh, so the, the, what we are really interested here is that uh, we have two probability distribution. Uh, one is the probability distribution of real images and the other one is the probability distribution of synthetic images generating through this pipeline. And we are really interested in comparing two probability distributions. How can we do it? Um, we can do it with a deep neural network D uh, that maps images into 0, 1. Okay. So the idea here is that this uh, particular deep neural network D, uh, if you have, if you sample uh, an image X from the real probability distribution, then the expectation of X dx is high. Okay. And if you are really sampling the X from the synthetic distribution, uh, the expectation of dx is low. Okay. So the idea here is that uh, uh, because the deep neural networks are so good at, at uh, uh, discriminating uh, uh, cat versus dog, you can imagine. So why not it, it will do the same job of discriminating real versus synthetic images? Because anyway, it is so very good at it. And we can use uh, backpropagation to train such a neural network. We already know about it. Okay. Very well. But now comes the second part. What we are really trying to do. Uh, now we are giving gradient feedback from discriminator 
back to the generator. So the think of discriminator as a critic. So it's a critic function that's saying, okay, the re real probability distribution is far away from the synthetic and it's trying to do it again and again. And whatever gradient it has that comes back as a feedback to the generator G so that it can do slightly better in the next step, okay? So what you are really doing is that uh, G of Z, which are the uh, uh, images that's generated, so the synthetic images. Um, so these synthetic images are passing through the uh, D and then the goal of the generator then is basically trying to make this expectation as high as possible. In the other words, its goal is to fool the discriminator. Its goal is to fool the critic by making synthetic images which are almost indistinguishable uh, uh, from the real images in the critic's eye. And since the critic is already very good, it's a deep neural network, so it's great at distinguishing between these two. So the generator is getting better and better. Good. And the next thing then is that basically you can back propagate through D of G of uh, your input. So this entire chain you can really back propagate. And then it becomes a game of many moves, which you can really draw that you have these uh, seeds from these you generate images or you get images from the real world and the discriminator D's job is to figure out whether the images are real or the fake. We can write down uh, this entire setup in a, in a minimax optimization problem um, where the first part is if the images are coming from the real, then the expectation should be as high as possible. So we are trying to maximize D. The second is uh, basically we are trying to minimize, uh, we are trying to maximize D of G of Z or we are trying to minimize one minus this form. Uh, F can be uh, many functions and for quite a lot of functions it can be shown at least theoretically that the equilibrium leg exists at zero sum under sufficient assumptions. Um, so for the first paper that came out, so that's now really famous from Yan Good, Yen Goodfellow uh, uh, back in 2014, uh, he used uh, this function f as log, logarithmic function. It's a, a monotonously, monotonously increasing function. And if you take the derivative of log x, you get 1 over x. So uh, that basically says that our training is quite sensitive to instances that defines awful. Um, you can also use uh, uh, f of x as simply x. In that case, you are penalizing uh, uh, all, all the samples equal. You are not really differentiating from one type to another. Um, so you can now really imagine that there is an industry of theoretical solutions being developed around the idea of such functions and their derivatives and how you can design loss functions around that. But we are not so much interested into that part of the theory. The next thing what I am really interested to talk to you about is how to really understand the key guns. Okay. So to understand the key guns, uh, uh, we have the theory and then we clean it up uh, 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 according to the Mary Kondo's way and really tidy guns into bringing, into really keeping those minimal things that brings joy to yourself. So as Mary Kondo is showing, uh, whatever makes you feel go like this, that, that's, that's the sort of minimal thing that we want to keep around. Uh, um, um, so, and of course, probably you are more like me whose uh, joy lies in the engineering recipe of the minimal things that we need to do to make things happen. You are not really caring so much into the uh, uh, theoretical part of it. 
So my engineering recipe to understand uh, general purpose gun literature is the following. Uh, you can focus on any of these general purpose architectures, uh, 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 general purpose guns based on their input outputs, the architecture they used, and the loss function. These, just these three are enough uh, to give you an intuition of uh, uh, really how to navigate through this uh, jungle of gun engineering and application papers. All right, so we will understand uh, three key generative adversarial networks, three key guns using the recipe uh, that I just uh, proposed to you. Um, so these three are the DC gun, conditional gun, and cycle gun. Uh, nowhere I'm claiming again to be exhaustive. Rather, I'm going to provide you intuitions of how to think uh, in terms of these blocks um, and rather the, the, the details of the convolution kernel that you can use or the sort of activation function that le leads to whatever performance. Uh, uh, it, it, it's quite important. Um, but you really can't appreciate it without having the global view of generative adversarial networks. So in this talk, I will be mainly focusing on that global view. And um, really, it's also quite difficult to think of the technology and how it might be useful without having the global view. So in a way, even for your problem that you wish to solve, you need to have this global view. Um, so um, let's first see about the uh, 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 deep convolutional guns, DC guns. So this is the first uh, gun architecture that actually generated quality images. Um, so this is unsupervised representation learning. And the idea here is to solve the problem of generating realistic images uh, from uh, looking uh, 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 from these random seeds. So what really uh, they ended up doing that uh, uh, they ended up proposing uh, latent representation learning that can produce such images. And one thing people might ask is that you have such over parameterized big, big neural networks that you only have so little amount of data to train your network. So maybe the network is just remembering those data points and not learning any representation at all. So what they really showed is the following, that if you are really uh, doing interpolation in the latent space, uh, you will notice that all those points are actually generating images that that actually shows that uh, uh, these are realistic so from here to here this is not in between there are random images these are really plausible images coming from the similar places and you can think of uh, uh, these interpolations so going from uh, 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 a bed all the way to something like a, uh, a view of, of an inside of a room this is quite plausible and sometimes a window is appearing, stuff like that. Um, so, great. One of the very first works that showed this is possible. Um, how did they do it? So the input here is a, a hundred dimensional multivariate Gaussian and the output is the image, of course. The architecture they followed is quite simple, the overall pattern. But if you are really going into the details of it, you will see that they are using these deconvolution ideas from the very earlier on. Uh, the, the, the input, of course, is 100 dimensional uh, Z, as we talked about, so 100 dimensional multivariate Gaussian. And the output is 64 by 64 images. And you can see three because these are color images, so three color channels. Um, the loss function was similar to the good fellows and it produced pretty nice results. Um, then the other idea around uh, uh, this was that we can actually have certain information about the data. 
Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, we might have some supervision. It might not be very detailed, but we can probably group whether like the zeros are different from ones, twos and threes and stuff like that. So this kind of supervision we can actually bring into our uh, structure of how you are learning the system. So uh, this is the idea of conditional generative adversarial networks, conditional GANs. Um, yeah, and this is actually quite realistic because it's unlikely that you will uh, sol be solving a problem where you have a big data set of pictures and you don't have any information at all. That's really unlikely to happen. Um, so if we are really trying to put a uh, cycle GAN in our recipe, we see that we have the uh, multidimensional Gaussian and the condition of zero on two dot 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 uh, uh, in, in case of if it's a, a MNIST uh, uh, handwritten uh, digit classification problem and output is still image. So the way the architecture is designed is the following. Um, you have your multidimensional Gaussian coming in but also the condition so the condition and the multi-dimension Gaussian together is producing the particular image or set of images. Um, when it comes to real image, based on that condition, you are drawing the set of images that belong to that class. So let's say if your class is 7, the condition is 7, and then from the random vector you are generating many 7s, and then you are looking at actual 7s, handwritten 7s, and then you are comparing it on the discriminator if it is real or fake. The loss function was quite similar to the uh, uh, Yan, Yan Goodfellows. Uh, the main difference was that uh, uh, this condition is appearing at both sides, both at the side of the discriminator as well as the side of generator. That's why this condition has connection to both the generator and the discriminator through the real images basically. Um, so this was relatively straightforward from DC gone to cycle gone. The real leap forward I would say came when we moved from this realm to the cycle gun realm. So cycle gun really changed the game altogether. And the idea here was quite revolutionary at the time. And the idea here is that how to incorporate unpaired images for style transfer or domain transfer. So imagine you are trying to transfer the style of a horse into a zeb zebra. So no self-respecting zebra will ever give you a pose based on a horse picture that you, sh you show it to the zebra. That That's not how it works. So you simply won't have a big data set that you really need of for uh, a supervised learning where you have pixel to pixel matches between horses and zebras with the same background, same stripes and all. That's not gonna happen ever. But that's not necessarily mean you cannot uh, make a horse look like a zebra and back again. And that's really the idea that uh, the authors proposed in CycleGon. So how the, the some of the images that you really see is quite astonishing that this horse uh, looks like this zebra. This zebra is quite plausible. I, I, I don't have any trouble uh, thinking of this as a zebra and if you see the background it's from greeneries to really beside a uh, 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 ocean I would say to a green field uh, the horse is moving to the zebra and well I mean one thing is interesting to notice is that probably a lot of the zebra pictures are coming to the savanna, from the African savanna. So whatever was more greenish, more bluish tint of the background is turning into more of a subdued African savanna color that you are expecting to see. Um, you can also do uh, similar things for apples to oranges and back again. Um, so yeah, so what's going on here? So 
the the cycle gone has input images from a domain and it gives us output and images from another domain and this is really unpaired and what you are trying to do you are trying to transfer from images from domain x to domain y so one example is something that i talked earlier uh, which is basically given such inputs uh, from um, uh, uh, your smartphone uh, you can try to draw uh, uh, how it would look like if Monet has painted it or Van Gogh or Cezanne Ukiwe, one of the uh, great painters of the earlier times mm. the architecture is quite interesting so this is the block design from the paper itself where what you are seeing here is that instead of one generator one discriminator you have well let me change it to my pen now you have two generators g and f and two discriminators dx and dy so what's going on really here is that uh, for the images coming from domain x the generator g is creating how it would look like in domain y and the generator f is then putting it back into uh, uh, the original domain itself um, and then the uh, then you have these two discriminators so if we are really trying to pull it out according to our scheme of drawing things it would look like this so uh, from the domain x you have given input to the uh, generator g um, the generator g has produced an output y and then you have real images from domain y both of which are go going through uh, uh, to the discriminate discriminator dy which is calling whether it's real or fake and these generated images then coming back through the uh, uh, second generator f and going all the way to here and then you are trying to figure out how similar it is to the actual uh, uh, images from the domain x so this is really interesting and what's uh, uh, further interesting is how this actually works or why would they even do it in this particular way so the idea is quite uh, uh, interesting because uh, the problem you have is that uh, in domain y you don't really have a correspondence of uh, of domain x right but you do know how things look like in domain x because that's where you started so instead of trying to find a loss function here we can use the cycle consistency and try to find a loss function here right so basically after starting here and going all the way and coming back here ideally i should look like the same thing so if for a data point x uh, uh, you can think of it is the data point x uh, uh, a person from a particular country went to another country uh, for traveling and came back ideally that person should stay the same or the nationality maybe uh, should stay stay the same if that's not the case then you can measure that difference and uh, that difference can give gradient feedback to all these networks and that's the big idea of cycle consistency that really lets you uh, do things which almost sounded fantastically impossible beforehand um and of course you can do it in both ways if you can if you have a lot of uh, uh, images from the domain y you can also calculate the cycle consistency in domain y same as if you have images from domain x that you can calculate cycle consistency in domain x you don't have to have any correspondence at all and that's really is the most interesting thing about uh, cycle gun that lets you do things which people thought almost impossible um so 
if we are really putting all these into a big uh, uh, table of summary uh, of the most important generative adversarial networks, we see that we have inputs, which can be just the uh, uh, seed, seed and condition, or images. The output rather remains similar. It's always about images. So if you remember from the very early on, I mentioned that um, if it's about generating pretty pictures, most likely uh, it is generative modeling. So this is the reason that most of the generative models actually end up generating pictures. Um, we talked about architecture starting from something quite simple with only a seed seed plus condition do we go all the way from domain to domain um, the loss also uh, was uh, gone modification of gone and then uh, cycle consistency along with the traditional gone losses um, that's that's roughly what it was so it you are quite unsupervised to some form of conditional supervision to all the way uh, almost something fantastic which is uh, style transfer so from here on now let's move on to back to our Mary Kondo way so we just took a massive pile of theory we cleaned it up we put it on the table and we said uh, thank you but we don't need you uh, to all those parts like per perplexity and we really kept the most important things and then we created the engineering recipe of which we felt joy and happiness that we have learned something new. Great. Now, let's move to our kitchen, which in this case is medical applications. So, yeah, this is your kitchen because this is really something that will probably bring food to your plate. Let's learn a lot about it. So we wrote a review articles about 80 papers uh, back in 2018 uh, uh, and then that actually got published back in 2020. It, sometimes it takes time to publish <laughs> such review articles. Uh, but these review articles, like this are a review article contains uh, uh, papers from Mikai, Middle, ISBI, TMI, Media, so you name it, all the, all the big uh, uh, conferences and journals, all the important venues, uh, we covered everything from there. Um, and then if we are really looking at uh, papers published till 2018, I can't tell you what happened after the two years because it's way too difficult to track papers coming out every other day. But if we are really looking at uh, uh, till that time, the majority of the initial gun works were in these two blocks, which are the about synthesis and segmentation, which is not really too difficult to guess why. Segmentation is anyway one the most uh, well studied uh, uh, problem in medical imaging. And synthesis is, of course, it's about synthesizing pretty pictures. So why synthesis will be there? Um, the bigger thing that we notice though is about the pattern and we notice that majority of the papers in the earlier part did either one of the two either they modified slightly modified the architecture or they slightly modified the loss function to fit the medical imaging application problem um so what i will do i will uh reapply uh, the recipe that we talk about uh, for uh, some problems. So we will sample a few walks from synthesis segmentation applications of GANs and we will reapply the engineering recipe of input output architecture loss function to really understand these new medical imaging papers from the basic principle of GAN research. Um, fair warning again, I am providing here the intuition. I am not gonna be talking about complete details of these works. Great. So let's look at the first of first work of ours, which is uh, about synthesis. Um, 
So imagine your advisor gave you a project to classify benign versus malign lesions uh, in the lung nodules. Um, now advisors being advisors, he or she has very little understanding of the data, uh, but you are living through the hell of little annotated data, okay? And your partner, the radiologist, even though promised uh, worlds, when it came to actually delivering the segmentation, he or she is always busy because of some reason, this or that. So how do you really solve this problem? One way of thinking about it is uh, to do unsupervised synthesis. And how they are doing it, uh, they are talking about synthesizing realistic looking nodules that can even fool radiologists into believing that these are real images. And if you can generate such realistic nodules about benign and malign lung uh, from the uh, uh, thoracic CT, that's really a significant advance. And uh, they actually employed a very interesting strategy uh, uh, to uh, evaluate their setup. It's, it's a visual Turing test of trying to fool two radiologists into believing that these images are uh, really uh, coming from real patient, real data, and not something that is generated by your uh, uh, um, generative adversarial network. Um, so their setup um, is quite simple. Uh, so they still have an input which is Z, a multidimensional seed, a multidimensional Gaussian seed. Um, now if you are really thinking about the DC gun paper, uh, which I just copy pasted here, you remember the DC gun image was color image. That's why it was 64 times 64 times 3 channels. Okay. And this one is the architecture and this one is the loss function. Now, as you know, lung nodules are grayscale images. You have seen that. So what they really changed is uh, this third dimension, which is now one. So it's grayscale image. And these dimensions are also changed slightly from 64 to 56, but that's not much of a difference. Um, their idea is uh, quite simple in terms of the architecture. So given such uh, uh, um, not, uh, like seeds, uh, you generate such images and you have a big pool of real images and you are passing these inside a discriminator to call it real or fake. Um, but if we are really looking at their paper and the uh, image they have given, it might be slightly tricky to understand what's going on here. So this image, this is the basic uh, recipe I talked about versus this is the image that uh, they have drawn in the paper. So it's slightly difficult until you really think about replacing the big blocks to get the intuition right. And if we are really putting the big, big blocks here, then this is the generator, which is the generator here. And this is the discriminator, which is the discriminator here. And if you have such an understanding, then it's very clear what's going on in this particular paper. Um, the next, um, uh, application I will talk about is from my colleague uh, Yelmar. Uh, this is also quite early back in 2017 when uh, what they did, uh, they had the problem of radiotherapy treatment planning and they have this MR uh, from which you can segment the tumors and the organs and you have CT for dose planning. Um, and this is really has to be CT because of the Homesfield units are important for all the uh, uh, softwares that people use for dose planning. Um, now, MR only radiotherapy planning can solve the problem by uh, uh, putting people into not at all the, the radiation exposure that they have to now go through for the uh, CTs. So this is very interesting problem. Uh, but how do you really solve it? Uh, you can think of 
registration as pre-processing that might be an option but there is a but and the problem of using registration as a pre-processing option is simply that uh, uh, there will be registration errors and that means the target will be different i mean the, the 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 registration error at the target will lead to uh, not having the patient's ct as uh, realistic as you wish to so what these people uh, these uh, group of researchers did they repurposed cycle gun um, and they have this uh, input domain x uh, so basically since they repurposed cycle gun i put it right here uh, our slide of cycle gun and let's see what they have done so now their input domain is mr and output is ct right so mr is the radiation free and ct is the radiation exposure so you don't want to have radiation exposure so you do mr and ct and that means the architecture looks like this your domain x is the mr domain your domain y is the ct domain and then your loss function is cycle loss uh, with slightly modification of cycle loss with the L1 norms of at the MR side and the CT side. Great. Um, now let's keep this particular picture intact and really look at the picture that these uh, uh, researchers put in the paper. So if you are really uh, seeing the pictures in the paper, they can be again uh, uh, slightly problematic uh, because it's really difficult to understand what's going on here. But if you are just putting these two side by side, maybe it's easy. So what's going on here, what they are calling it as forward cycle. So just think of this as from domain X going through the generator G all the way here. Okay, so you have your MR images, you are synthesizing to synthetic CT and you have your real images and you have your discriminator. So that's the forward cycle and the backward cycle is the opposite of that. And that's what uh, like is a really nice way of thinking about what's going on in this paper versus uh, just trying to guess what's going on from looking at this image itself. The third problem or the third medical imaging problem that I will talk about. This is a paper that's uh, coming from Costas. And this is a paper where uh, the idea is to do domain adaptation using adversarial learning. Um, so the problem is really uh, uh, when you are trying to use deep learning for seg segmentation, um, it performs very well when you are in the same domain but the performance degrades when you are going to the new domain. Um, so we have uh, uh, this possibility of using transfer learning, which probably quite li like most of you are familiar with uh, to solve this problem, but you might not even have labeled data in the target domain to solve this problem really. Um, so how we can do it, how we can really come up with the uh, uh, solution. So let's talk a little bit about the problems first. So this is the problem coming from traumatic brain injury and you are trying to segment bleeding. So most of the uh, 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 most of this is done under MR and MR has this they have this multi-parametric multi MR where most of these sequences like three or four sequences flare g uh, uh, are similar t1 uh, star t2 star and then there are some which are different so here you can see that in the source domain most of the uh, um, uh, sequences are similar but this uh, source domain has a g sequence where, whereas uh, trans target domain has an swi sequence if you are not doing any adaptation uh, the performance of the network is very well in the source domain, but it's all over the place in the target domain. Um, of course, humans don't have that, that problem and you can see the manual segmentation here. Um, so what uh, the authors proposed here is to use the adversarial learning strategy 
to learn domain invariant features. And the auxiliary task here is the adversarial learning, learning task. Um, so let's take a look at what's going on here. Uh, so I wanted to really simulate here the impression of reading the paper directly. If you are like me, um, you are probably looking at this picture coming from the paper. Uh, and this picture might freak you out a bit. At least it did to me. Uh, forget about the intricacies of the network. Just trying to understand what's going on in the overall, it's it's way too difficult because it's like an MR image I can see and everything is a blur uh, as I go to the right side of the picture. So what I will try to do, I will say that let's first understand the blocks and then we will talk about the later part. So let's think of this top as the segmenter which segments um, so but is you can think of it as your generator G so basically uh, if you have any set of MR images uh, uh, the generator produces not another stylistic image but the segmentation of the image same dimension but the segmentation and then you can think of the bottom part as your discriminator okay and that really makes things simple. Now really let's try to understand what's going on here. Um, so the discriminator is trying to discriminate whether the images are coming, these images are coming from the source domain or the target domain. What is the necessary condition for the discriminator to be successful? The discriminator can be successful just because the discriminator is in Re, like getting information from this middle layer of the segmenter of the generator then that means it sucks it can only be successful if this middle layer contains uh, information about the domain if it's a since it's a segmenter the idea here is that it should not contain any information about the domain itself. It should only contain the necessary information for segmentation. So what you are doing by playing this adversarial learning role, uh, uh, play, you are taking out, soaking out all the domain specific information that is there in the segmenter and you are only keeping the information that is uh, necessary to segment the, 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 the MR sequences. And if you can see here the results, you will see that uh, adversarial learning results to uh, a better quality segmentation. I mean, these are usable, whereas these are not usable at all. Um, and that's that's really wonderful result. And finally, let's talk about the issues of generative adversarial network. Uh, that you should be aware of uh, to have realistic expectations. Um, so I must say uh, after the closet, the kitchen, now we are getting into the emotional uh, uh, stuffs of your uh, belongings. And these are really something also quite close to my heart I, I really follow how the things are developing more from the methodological point of view of course this is not a place where we can go into the details of methodological aspects of how to solve things but i will still try to uh, provide you a little bit of uh, 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 um, sprinkles around how people are thinking about this one of the first things that uh, you hear when you are talking about uh, limitation of guns is the numerical instability and in particular the problem of mode collapse. So uh, uh, to really understand the practical problem of mode collapse, we just look at uh, these problems uh, uh, in the practical setting, how, how these problems appear. Um, these problems, I should also say that 
traditionally was not so much as reported into the papers but if you are really scouring the web long enough uh, about a particular thing because you are obsessed about it then you find such interesting uh, pictures these days of course people are becoming more famous like more open about it and especially once you have solutions then you acknowledge the problem because then you can say you are delivering the solution for the next paper that you are writing um i could not find uh, much of equivalent medical images but i can imagine uh, where things can go wrong here so this is the problem where the guns have trouble counting so you can see the number of faces here or here number of legs so these are the things that you typically imagine that if the network is good at generating realistic looking images it should really do well here but that's not the case so in terms of medical image equivalent cases you can think of if you are really trying to uh, uh, do something about the pathological images and then the, the number of cells that you see in a uh, uh, um, in a pathological image that 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 might be trickier if if you are generating such weird Im Im image information the second one really is about perspective it's almost picasso like a uh, distortion of perspective that you you see when uh, uh, these uh, uh, generative adversarial networks fail um, a med medical equivalent could be cross domain synthesis and where perspectives gets distorted and finally uh, it's about the global structure so when we think about the real world we have a general idea of the global structures of things that's not so much about guns so you can see a dog which barely looks like a dog or how this dog is kind of shifted and folded and i don't know twisted in a certain way uh, same here so we can put all these things under the common symptom of mode collapse um, where basically if you have more uh, uh, samples from one mode and less from another these kind of weird things might happen um, there are also other explanations but mode collapse is the one that you will hear quite often um, i argue and many others argue is uh, really the core issue is training instability so if the training is not stable enough um, you will always encounter such issues the problem though is uh, typically if you have such an over parameterized setup and then so much of it is going on uh, around these uh, big problems of image generation in a higher dimensional space you don't really know which sort of algorithms that's being used for training guns are actually stable and which are not so uh, there is this one very interesting paper about gun convergence it's called Dirac gun and that talked about really breaking the problem down in its core form and it says basically you have a generator which is basically a distribution uh, that you are trying to generate, which is the Dirac del delta function or the Dirac theta. So you have the P theta, it calls del theta. Um, and the discriminator is a linear discriminator of uh, parameterized by phi or psi. Uh, so basically we have this two parameter family of theta and psi, and we are trying to learn uh, data distribution del zero so training data is always zero so basically that means you are looking at zero zero equilibrium so we have uh, uh, here uh, uh, such a setup where you can think of center of the images is the zero zero and then uh, you have one dimension of it is theta and another dimension is phi and you can like because it's so low dimensional such a simplified setup you can just put many particles so just think of it as many different initialization of your neural network and what then you can see is that for different algorithms how the convergence works 
and we have these beautiful beautiful uh, uh, visualizations of this convergence that's created by Jonathan uh, Sirius Brast who was uh, uh, taking one of the lectures that I was giving and he came up with these beautiful visualizations it's it looks good but what's really going on here um, so I did not really talk so much about the extensions of uh, uh, algorithmic ways of guns but because I guess a lot of you are have advanced knowledge so some of you have heard of the wars was the Stein guns and was the Stein guns with gradient penalty stuff like that to to solve the problem of traditional guns so let's see from the training dynamics uh, these three things and of course as you can see from the top uh, none of these three actually converge so this is the Wasserstein gun which was an extension of gun and then this gradient penalty is the modern version that people use and if we really see here uh, the traditional gun this uh, comes up with something which is a, a curl uh, and if you are uh, uh, going through this curl again and again forever uh, it doesn't matter where your uh, particles start or where you initialize in this domain you will never end up at the middle of it um, we can see the Wasserstein gun that has a particular uh, let's say numerical um, how to say it numerical hack that they did to make things happen so that that, that has a particular assumption uh, assumption about the function that is it's about the continuity of the function and they, they did had to do this numerical hack so that's why you see things cut from here and here but that doesn't solve the problem that we talked about um the gradient penalty is also trying to go in uh, uh, in a slightly different fashion but the most important thing is like when you think of of so many different initializations how many particles ended up at the center zero zero the equal the point of equilibrium of the minimax game for all three none of the particles none of the initializations really uh, laid here so what really does actually converge uh, so there we can uh, uh, talk about so i briefly mentioned these two uh, algorithms uh, one is the instant noise and another is the instance noise and another is the consensus optimization so here you can see many of the uh, dots if you can see these are where the particles are so all over the place you are starting and let's see how the convergence happens so both uh, the instance noise and the cons consensus optimization does converge so it's just probably not enough to think about the big pictures if you are really wanting your algorithms to do well uh, you actually should also think uh, you, if you are really trying to make sure that your guns generate pictures that are meaningful not just pretty and the distribution it's actually uh, generating from is is also realistic then you have to think also the algorithms along with the overall uh, stuffs. I created a small reading list for you guys. Nowhere I'm claiming to be exhaustive. Rather, I'm going to provide intuitions again of where you might uh, uh, get some information. So we talked about engineering recipes for three papers uh, uh, that, that's there. Uh, we also have a living review. Uh, these are the medical imaging papers that we talked about. Um, we have uh, the theory papers, more interested ones are can read this particular papers, uh, um, numerics of guns from which the consensus, consensus optimization comes in if guns is a sort of extension of some of the ideas and our guns created equal is the paper from which uh, this Dirac gun and this this um, optimization idea is inspired there are also blog posts out there uh, so this is something uh, to think about when you are trying to gather information from the web. You really get so many sources and you really don't know which one you should believe in. 
So I would definitely suggest these blog posts are believable sources uh, written by excellent people who has a great understanding. And now I will talk briefly about the Mikhai workshop and challenge that we are organizing. So uh, in Mikhai 2021, most of you are probably familiar or even heard of Mikhai at least. That's the premier medical image analysis, medical image computing and image guided surgery venue in the world. Uh, so that's the most internationally most recognized etc venue. And we are organizing a workshop about deep generative models for Mikai. Unfortunately, the web page is not up yet because we learned that this got accepted very, very late. Uh, uh, and I'm just recording it right after that. However, uh, uh, the if you just follow some of our ideas of what can be presented, it's about novel architectures, loss functions, theoretical understandings, uh, multimodality, cross-modality and learning, transfer, metrics, uncertainty estimates, uh, generative, generating models limited for limited sparse or noisy input data, domain adaptation. Uh, these days, the learning from synthetic data is also getting familiar. So how to generate synthetic data? All these are very uh, in topics that we are really interested in. We also have two keynote talks, uh, one uh, from the MIC, uh, so that's Andreas Meyer uh, from uh, FAU Erlangen and the other is from Stefanie Speidel who is uh, uh, from, again from Germany, from uh, Dresden. Um, and this workshop will be complemented nicely by the adapter challenge that we are organizing uh, within the workshop. The idea here is that uh, if you are trying to do minimally invasive surgery, uh, you won't get annotated data from real surgery so much. So you can really perform uh, uh, on phantom data surgery and this is your simulation domain. And from there, you have the OR domain on which we wish to validate. So what sort of translation uh, uh, ca uh, like image to image translation can you do so that uh, you train your neural network on this data for particular tasks such as this these points detection of these points that that generalizes to actual OR data so that's the challenge is about so those of you who are interested either in methodological development or already have developed some method or try out really methods but don't know which problem you should uh, uh, start with, I would say we are providing a very, very comprehensive uh, venue. Uh, such venue was not there for Mikai where you can see both uh, Mikai uh, like a workshop and a challenge for comprehensive discussion about the deep generative modeling, generative adversarial networks. So yeah, we, I'm, I'm really excited about this. This is a very nice uh, 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 collaboration, uh, collaborative, let's say, uh, project that, that involves many, several uh, uh, um, continents even. So we have uh, organizers from Asia, Australia, America, uh, Europe, and we are really looking forward to that. Um, so in conclusion, uh, we I talked about GANs for unsupervised generative models uh, with an adversarial twist. Um, when done correctly, we have seen realistic looking images of unprecedented quality. In terms of medical imaging, we have seen synthesis for as a proxy for training data is something that uh, uh, we can imagine a lot of work going on. There is also talked about uh, domain shift and how adversarial learning can help. In this context, I will just mention to again the, the paper, the review paper that we have written. So that's a great uh, place to start start yourself acquainted with what sort of medical imaging research in the earlier days of GAN was going on and then you can branch into more specific uh, uh, things that's being developed in the last year or so. There are also issues about numeric instability which I briefly touched. What I didn't touch upon is the evaluation metric. So what sort of evaluation can you do to make sure the images that's produced by your guns are realistic and also something that can be helpful in the bigger clinical setting? So that's an open question. Um, 
yeah so in conclusion um the professors and grad students uh if you plan to play uh with fire please work with more generative models and specifically guns all the best to those grad students who will be playing with uh such firearms as guns uh you need it believe me uh because more often than not guns will backfire uh when explosion happens uh focus on the discriminator loss and try to see how the loss is converging if it is suddenly converging to a particular level that might be the reason of the explosion and then you really try to adjust your hyperparameter to ensure such thing doesn't happen uh and uh, that way you can stabilize the finicky behavior in general but when the guns will fire watch out for some fireworks thank you very much for your attention